Good morning and welcome. This is uh, a panel sponsored by the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. I'm Barry Rabe. I'm a professor here at the Ford School. <laughs> and since July of this year, I've had the privilege to direct Close Up. I want to begin by thanking the Ford School Domestic Policy Corps for co-sponsoring this. I also want to thank members of the Close Up staff, particularly Tom Ivaco and Bonnie Roberts for all their work uh, on this event. Um, the issue of hydraulic fracturing and shale gas is such an intriguing issue to think about from so many perspectives. This is an area where, given the structure of federal statute, the federal role is currently constrained. States and local governments, very much at the center of the concern for close up, are major, major players in varying degrees, depending upon the nature of the resource they do not or do or do not have beneath their land surface. It is clearly an issue that is beginning to emerge in the state of Michigan. It is an issue that has emerged much more dramatically in other jurisdictions. And so at the center, we wanted to take an early look at this issue and also work in a rather unique partnership with our good friend and colleague Paul Caron, a uh, professor here at the Ford School who teaches a wonderful undergraduate course called Thinking Analytically About the Problems of the Day, for which over the last several weeks, Professor Courant and I have been leading a fracking module. There are many students from that class here today. This is part of their, their activity, and so we have a large contingent of undergraduates participating. We also have a very nice cohort of our MPP students, either playing the role of research assistants or GSIs for this, so we're really cutting across the Ford School community, as well as bringing in uh, outside visitors for, for this activity. I don't know that five or six years ago, many of us would be expected to be gathering here talking about words like hydraulic <laughs> fracturing or shale gas, even though those are issues that have been around now for a while in Michigan and other jurisdictions. But it is, of course, an incredible time for a relook at that issue. In Michigan just last week, Governor Snyder devoted a good portion of his address on energy and environment to some of these various issues. And we were delighted to see that the governor noted the Graham Institute's role in pursuing an integrated assessment. Actually, a shout out to the Graham Institute in the middle of that talk. And we're delighted to have some of our colleagues here from Graham and certainly are eager to help the, that project in any way that we possibly can. So there is a certain ascendancy in Michigan. We also thought in the case of Pennsylvania, which passed pioneering historic and controversial legislation last year, that uh, a Supreme Court case in Pennsylvania might be decided by now. That is still before the courts. And we also saw, interestingly, last week, the first candidate for the Democratic nomination for governor in Pennsylvania run on largely a fracking platform, challenging the incumbent, gearing up for 2014. So fracking emerges in all sorts of ways. And of course, we're only 23 days away from the event we are all waiting for, which is the release of the Matt Damon movie called Promise Land, <laughs> which will once and for all resolve the issues of fracking, which focuses very much on the case of Pennsylvania. Mr. Damon could not be with us this morning. <laughs> but we are delighted while Matt Damon is promoting his movie, uh, we're here and we have a terrific panel. Let me briefly introduce these folks and, and then move on. Uh, delighted to welcome Jacqueline Pless who is an energy policy, policy specialist at the National Conference of State Legislatures. Uh, Jacqueline has worked in a number of areas in the energy policy arena and has done some terrific work looking across all of the states, including Michigan, but all of the states that have some involvement on this issue, whether it's severance taxation, regulatory policy, and has put together a series of ongoing reports and really providing a tremendous public service, sort of her finger on the pulse of how different states are beginning to pursue this. And so we're delighted to welcome Jacqueline from Denver. She will be followed by Christopher Borick, a professor at Muhlenberg College and director of the Muhlenberg Institute of Public Opinion. Chris will be talking about the first wave of findings uh, which we have been working at with close up, the first attempt to gauge public opinion in the state of Michigan with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Similar questions being asked at the same time. We're also joined by Erica Brown and Christy Hartman, MPP students who have been RAs and will be co authors of a report that close up in Muhlenberg will be releasing later in the week. Would also add that Chris has really entered the pantheon of 
of, of leading national survey researchers. We all knew that was the case, but check out Nate Silver's ranking of America's top pollsters related to elections, and you'll see Chris very prominently displayed uh, there. And so we welcome Chris back to our, to, our, to our halls. And also delighted to welcome Eric Schwartzel. Um, we learned that um, in looking at the Pennsylvania case, if you can imagine this, in 2009, 8.9, I'm jumping slides here, I'm sorry, 8.9% uh, of all local media coverage on all sorts of issues in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania was on the issue of fracking, has reached that <laughs> level of sensitivity and that level of saliency. We don't know, but I think Eric may have written half of that content. <laughs> he is a remarkably prolific author. He has won a wide, wide range of awards uh, both for his own writing and his leadership of Pipeline. If you want to look at what one local media outlet can do to provide a tremendous public service on a range of coverage on this issue, take a look at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and in particular, Pipeline, which is Eric's baby and his product, which he leads, which is a remarkable database and website on all aspects of the hydraulic fracturing and shale gas issue, both from Pennsylvania, but increasingly a comparative perspective. So we think we have really a terrific team of panelists, and then we will be following it up in Q&A while we would very much like to sort of open it up for discussion. Given the large attendance, we're actually going to turn to sort of an expert set of, 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 of panelists. Scott Miller, who we're delighted to welcome from Ohio University, where he heads the Energy and Environment Program at the Voinovich School of Public Affairs. We could not let an event like this go forward without letting, letting Professor Courant ask a question. And then we're going to leave time for our two uh, student co-authors, Christy Hartman and Erica Brown, to ask a question as well, assuming time permitting. Uh, with that, uh, we, let's get launched. I'm delighted to welcome you, Jacqueline. Thank you. Just need to pull my presentation back. Sorry about that. That's okay. Good morning, and thank you for that introduction. Can you hear me all okay? No. Okay. Is that better? In the back? Okay. So you all are here today because unless you've been living under Iraq for the past year or so, you have uh, seen the big energy buzzword fracking in the headlines. And of course, um, there are just a few things that I'm hoping everyone will walk away today knowing. Um, but basically, I have a lot of information to share in a short amount of time, so I'm going to try and talk as fast as possible. Um, if I'm talking too fast, just throw tomatoes at me or something. But uh, so essentially, I want you all to really understand what fracking is, uh, why it's an issue now, and then kind of uh, receive a state legislative overview of how the 50 states are addressing this issue. So first, just a quick note about NCSL, which is the organization that I work for. Um, it's a bipartisan organization, so we do not offer um, any ad advice to legislatures, but we simply provide information. We serve uh, the legislatures and staff of the nation's 50 states, commonwealths, and territories, and we provide research, technical assistance, and opportunities for policymakers to exchange ideas on pressing state issues. Um, I particularly work in our energy program, as uh, Dr. Ray Pett says. So what is fracking? Um, it's an oil and gas extraction method hydro where hydraulic pressure is used to create fractures in shale rock. Uh, pressurized liquids are pumped underground to help release the trapped gas. And essentially, this is allowed for commercially viable access to previously inaccessible unconventional oil and gas resources, such as shale gas, which is making up an increasingly large portion of the energy supply in the US. So why now? Why, why all the hype? Uh, these recent advances, um, te technological advances uh, in natural gas drilling have opened up resources that were uneconomical or inaccessible just a decade ago. This has expanded supplies so much that some forecast current consumption levels could be sustained for another century. But there is increased public concern. Um, it, the, the new technology is allowing access to gas in areas that are unfamiliar with the practice, um, particularly in more densely populated regions. And there's increased concern um, and attention to its potential effects on human health and the environment. At the same time, the natural gas industry offers tremendous economic benefits to state and local economies. Um, so in a time of tight, tight state budgets, this, this is a major factor that state legislators are considering. And states are grappling with how to balance taking advantage of the economic benefits while also protecting public health and the environment. So this is just a, a quick little visual of um, the shell plays that are in, in the lower 48, just to, to kind of 
have an understanding of how expansive this resource really is here. Um, in, particular, the in particular, the gas rush of the Marcellus Shale Play, which stretches from Ohio to upstate New York, which lies beneath two-thirds of Pennsylvania, holds incredibly, incredibly expensive resources. Um, projections indicate that the Marcellus region alone could provide enough natural gas to satisfy U.S. demand for at least a decade. So here we can see how shale gas in particular is playing an increasingly important role in the nation's energy portfolio. Uh, this shows U.S. gas uh, production projections through 2035, and you can see that shale gas production is expected to account for nearly 50% of total U.S. production in 2035, compared to just 23% in 2010. So extracting natural resources uh, can produce significant economic benefits for state and local economies. Uh, from manu manufacturing all the way to the wellhead, the industry makes contributions to the broad broader economy in terms of job creation, capital expenditures, GDP and tax revenues, and lower natural gas and electric uh, power prices. Uh, in addition, it also brings um, increased domestic energy uh, security benefits as well. Although fracking offers all of these benefits, its rapid expansion near densely populated areas has increased attention to its potential effects on human health and the environment. Uh, for instance, one of the biggest concerns is that hydraulic fracturing could contaminate public uh, drinking water resources. Uh, fl fracking fluid can contain hazardous chem chemicals, and if it's mismanaged, it could be released by spills or leaks. Uh, fracking also requires large amounts of water, so in some regions, water withdrawals could affect aquatic habitats or the availability of water. Um, also on the waterfront, fracking produces wastewater that must be treated properly before it's dis disposed, um, so that remains a challenge in some states. Air quality is a concern. Natural gas systems are one of the largest methane emit emitters in the U.S., and ex increased exploration and development also impacts the surrounding environment, wildlife, and human populations. Uh, vegetation and soils are disturbed as gas wells can require roads clearing and leveling. And lastly, recent se seismic activity in Ohio and Oklahoma are drawing attention to a possible link between earthquakes and deep wells used to dispose of waste for hydraulic fracturing. So that's just a, a quick little uh, background, and I really want to get into more of the meat of my presentation here, and that's, that's what the, the states are doing. Um, and as you can see, this is a map of, of states that have introduced legislation in 2011 and 2012, and at least 158 bills in 26 states have been introduced. Um, the lightest blue here are states that have introduced one to four bills. Uh, the the medium-toned blue um, are states that have introduced five to ten bills. And then the darkest blue, you can see New York and Pennsylvania, have in introduced more than 20 bills. Pennsylvania has introduced uh, 28 and New York 52. So th this is you know, obviously been an issue where states are really starting to focus um, on, and uh, they do have regulatory primacy on this issue. So this I just thought was a quick, um, nice visual to, to compare where the, the shale regions are and where the state legislative activity is taking place. And you can really see how um, the kind of the, the darker blues are in the regions where Marcellus is starting to be developed. So, um, you know, more than 150 bills in just two years, that's, that's a lot of action, and um, state legislatures are mostly working to alleviate public health and environmental concerns while also taking advantage of economic potential offered by shale ga gas development. So specific proposals include things like severance tax structure changes, uh, well spacing requirements, setback requirements, waste treatment and disposal regulations, and requirements to publicly disclose the names and composition of fracking fluid chemicals. So at least nine states have proposed um, disclosure requirements. At least eight states have proposed casing, integrity, well spacing, setback, water withdrawal type proposals. At least 11 states have looked at their severance taxes, and at least eight states have proposed um, either suspensions or moratoria or studies to investigate the potential impacts of fracking. <coughs> So the most, the most frequently addressed trend this session for in, is for um, increasing transparency and helping to monitor the fluids that are injected in the process. Um, and one, one way that states are looking to do that is by uh, requiring disclosure of the fluid additives. So this is a map. Um, it's a little bit old. It's from March, but it's still a good visual to see the trend. Uh, the darkest blue here are states that um, have existing disclosure requirements but haven't necessarily introduced new legislation to change 
to change that structure. Um, the medium tone blue are states that have introduced new disclosure requirements that did already have a, have a tax in, intact. And then the lightest blue are states that have um, seen some form of legislation introducing, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I think I switched, switched that out. Medium tone have no disclosure, yeah, no disclosure requirements as of yet. And then the lightest blue are states introducing legislation to change existing requirements. So recent research released by the University of Texas, and, and like any other research, it um, needs to be taken with a grain of salt, but it, it did not find a direct link between hydraulic fracturing and groundwater pollution. Um, but above ground spills, leaking drill casings, and wastewater mishandling may be more common causes. Um, so possible solutions can, uh, that states are starting to, to look at include more stringent regulation of drill casings or other mechanical integrity measures. Uh, for instance, Illinois introduced a bill uh, that would require integrity tests of casings or other mechanical testing prior to fracking. Um, there is pending legislation in New York that would require certificates of competence to use a derrick or other drilling equipment, and Pennsylvania has also seen a number of, of similar bills. Spills can also occur during waste transportation. Um, so a, a number of states have, have looked at this issue, but in particular Pennsylvania's House Bill 1741 would require vehicles to display a placard on the outside of the vehicle indicating it is carrying uh, fracking wastewater. And states are also addressing waste treatment and disposal in a variety of ways, partially due to uh, unique geological factors. So for instance, uh, Illinois is looking at legislation that would address disposal and reuse of well simulation fluid that's recovered during flowback. Um, New York has a bill pending that would prohibit treatment, discharge, disposal, or storage of wastewater in the state. And um, New York has some pending legislation. Um, this is just one, one quick example that would require treatment works to refuse industrial waste from fracking operations that contain high levels of radium. Well setbacks or location restrictions can help create buffers between drilling and public drinking water resources. So for instance, there, there's pending legislation in New York that would prohibit drilling within you know, some set uh, number of miles from the New York City water supply infrastructure. And then Pennsylvania also has some similar uh, setback and well, well location restriction legislation pending. So hydraulic fracturing may lead to competition for scarce water supply in some regions. So we see some states, um, such as California, that we're looking to at least uh, require the amount of and source of the water to be recorded just to kind of start this monitoring process to see uh, what the effects really could be. Water quality monitoring may help improve knowledge of how fracking affects water supplies and quality. Um, so for instance, in New York, there's pending legislation that would require groundwater testing prior to and after drilling wells for oil and gas. And lastly, um, some states are, well not lastly, but um, some states are looking to kind of delay fracking operations until more is known about the effects. So for instance, uh, here in Michigan, there is a bill introduced that would prohibit fracking under certain circumstances. Um, in New, New York is putting everything on hold and, and really just conducting a lot of studies right now on the impacts of fracking. And Vermont enacted a, a bill, House Bill 464, to prohibit fracking in the state. Severance taxes, um, just a quick overview, there are excise, excise taxes on resources that are extracted from the earth or severed from the earth. Um, and most natural gas producing states have some form of severance tax. Severance taxes have historically been the source of a significant stream of revenue for en energy rich states. And in 2010, more than $11 billion were generated in the US from severance taxes alone. So it's a huge revenue source for states that do have this energy. Uh, they can help ensure the costs associated with resource extraction are paid by the producers, alleviating some of the potential effects felt by local communities. So here we can see that at least 11 states considered legislation to impose new or amend existing oil and gas severance taxes. Just excuse me one second. So over um, the last legislative session, 12 states have actually enacted legislation. 
Um, and this is just kind of a listing of some of those bills. Uh, clearly, there's still a lot that's pending. Um, but in Idaho, they impose restrictions on the ability of localities to regulate oil and gas. Indiana required adoption of rules addressing reporting and disclosure. Uh, Kansas allowed a commission to promulgate rules addressing disclosure. Louisiana addressed disclosure. Um, Maryland passed a bill that established a presumptive impact area around drill sites. Uh, New Jersey imposed a one-year moratorium, um, which was passed but then vetoed. And Ohio addressed horizontal, horizontal well production training and employment. Pennsylvania, which um, Eric will actually talk a lot more about, passed a bill that addressed disclosure impact fees, um, local ordinances, kind of a, it was kind of a large overhaul, um, but Eric will talk more about that. In South Dakota, um, a resolution passed that urged Congress to clearly delegate responsibility to regulate to the states, um, just kind of opposing federal regulation of shale gas activity. Um, Tennessee passed a resolution that encouraged meeting to propose regulations and protect water, kind of a, a wishy-washy type of bill. Uh, Utah passed a, a, res, a resolution that urged Congress to also clearly delegate responsibility to regulate to the states, and then Vermont prohibited fracking in the state. So um, we're here mostly to also focus on Pennsylvania and Michigan, which Chris and Eric will do. Um, but Pennsylvania did pass House Bill 1950, which is now Act 13. Uh, it's very controversial. Controversial. Um, there's a lot going on. It addresses local ordinances, impact fees, how those impact the, the revenue generated from those fees is distributed, uh, well location restrictions, well reporting, a number of aspects of shale gas development. And then what's happening in Michigan? Um, you heard Professor Rabe just talk about uh, Governor Snyder's recent remarks and kind of uh, prioritizing natural gas development in the state. And then also there are a number of, a couple of bills that were introduced in the state as well. Uh, for instance, House Bill 5565, which would require authorization from the Department of Environmental Quality for hydraulic fracturing treatments. Um, there's a, a, a bill that would prohibit fracking under certain circumstances, a bill that would provide for a study of fracking, and then also a bill that would create a presumption of liability for contamination of groundwater caused by chemicals. So overall, um, natural gas development offers tremendous economic benefits, and states are working to ensure that the resource is developed safely. Uh, it's a hot issue in state legislatures, especially in densely populated regions where the practice is unfamiliar. Uh, the, lo the hottest legislative trend has been increasing transparency through fracking fluid chemical disclosure requirements. Um, states are also looking at other measures to help protect public drinking water resources, such as mechanical integrity requirements. Uh, to pre prevent spills and leaks. And then severance taxes generate revenue and states are adjusting rate structures in various ways and, and looking at how to, how to really optimize the amount of revenue that is generated for the state. So this is just my, my contact information. I'm told that it will be posted at some point. Um, NCSL has a number of resources that have 50 state tables of all this legislation, um, but hopefully I just provided an okay overview in the meantime. Thank you. I lost it. I thought you were going to do it. That's, that was close. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bonnie. Thanks, Jacqueline, and thanks, Barry, and everybody else for, uh, for inviting me to this event. And um, we're lucky today we're going to be able to share some of our first, uh, for, first for the public, uh, a picture of what Michiganders uh, think about fracking and how Pennsylvanians, uh, a state that we've talked about already a little bit and Eric will talk about in detail, uh, ha have viewed the, this issue. And it's part of, um, just a quick plug, uh, the, part of a, a broader a, array of surveys, the National Survey of Energy and the Environment that uh, close up here at the Ford School and the Institute of Public Opinion at Muhlenberg are doing. We're doing a number of studies on climate change, uh, energy, and the environment, and this is, is part of that overall group. So with that, um, I, I think Jacqueline did a wonderful job of making a case that fracking is emerging and has emerged as a policy issue 
throughout the United States uh, and in some places in, in a major way like Pennsylvania and others in a, in a developmental way. Uh, Pennsylvania and Michigan therefore represent two uh, parts of a, of a broader continuum or two points on a broader continuum of fracking activity. Pennsylvania may be considered the the, the center, if you will, or the most active right now for a number of reasons. The, the, num the number of wells, the engagement going on, the public discourse, uh, in some ways some hyper uh, public uh, debate about the subject. While Michigan is somewhere in the middle, I would say, uh, as you look at states. I think Jacqueline did a nice job. It's, it's developing here. It's on the public radar. It's on, on government's uh, agenda, but perhaps not, not fully developed in a way that Pennsylvania has seen it. Uh, as Eric will describe, when you look at Pennsylvania, it has, over the last year, been completely engaged, uh, including major, major legislation passed earlier this year, uh, Act 13, as Jacqueline talked about, that has established a very uh, interesting array of policies in, in Pennsylvania that are, that are unique, uh, that are highly controversial and very debatable, and we'll look a little bit at that. And as, as also as noted, and folks that are following this issue in uh, Michigan, Governor Snyder's uh, address, public address last, last week, spotlighted the growing role and importance that the governor and others are placing on fracking as part of the broader energy uh, and uh, economic aspects of, of life in Michigan. So what we wanted to do with this study is to look a little bit at the public perspective. Clearly it's on the government radar. Clearly, it's in the policy development stage at sub-national levels of, of government, including Michigan and in Pennsylvania. But as the fracking, as fracking grows as an issue, what does the public think about it? How does the public view this issue? What do they know? What do they think? What do they want uh, in regard to this, this emerging, emerging topic? And in this particular research, we offer a little bit of insight into how the public in two different states, Pennsylvania and Michigan, view this issue. And I, I think it, picture, it paints a picture that's fascinating in terms of where we'll see congruence of public opinion and also some differences, notable, I think, uh, related to the areas that we're looking at. So a little bit quickly about the survey methodology. If anybody wants to know more, I'm sure you can go to, uh, to our friends at Close Up and they could provide you the, the details. But uh, it was two surveys done just this October, one in Michigan, one in Pennsylvania. Uh, sample size is uh, just over 400 with margins of error, plus or minus five. It included both landlines and cell phones. Uh, in both of those states, and again, I'll, I'll be happy to talk lots about the, the detailed methods, but they're, they're telephone surveys. And the surveys do a couple of things. They, they first want to ask about general knowledge, public perception, and general attitudes about fracking. Does the public know about fracking, and what is their overall view about the, the, the concept? Um, so ha has the public heard? How closely do they follow the debate? What's the public's general perception about the issue and the impact on, on their lives and their state? So we'll start off with this question. How much have you heard about fracking? Pretty, pretty simple, you know, as, as we ask. Uh, either a lot, a little, or you've never heard about it at all. And as you can see, uh, Pennsylvanians are slightly more likely, but not much more likely, to have heard about that concept. In other words, even in a place like Michigan, you had 40% of the public say they heard a lot and 42% a little. Only 17%, less than one in five Michiganders said they haven't heard about this issue. Uh, I think giving a sense that, that it is, you know, a, a few years ago, if we said the word frack, uh, you know, people would kind of stare at you a little funny and, and they'd probably think you might have said something inappropriate. Uh, now it's something that is very much part of the, uh, of the, of the vernacular. Uh, in Pennsylvania, as we said before, almost half of the individuals in the state said uh, they have heard a lot of, uh, about the issue. And that's uh, not surprising. I'm a little surprised that it was so close be between Michigan and Pennsylvania. Uh, now just moving up as a layer from have you heard about it, how closely are you following the debates about fracking in, in your state? In other words, for the public, are they, are they actively looking and listening to the debates going on? And as you can see here, uh, again, generally familiar or similar patterns between Michigan and Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvanians are slightly more likely to say uh, they are, are watching it somewhat closely, about an 11% gap, but not enormous differences between the, the two states. Again, a little bit surprising given that in Pennsylvania uh, the issue has been so dominant in terms of the public and in the press uh, compared to a, a rather emerging point of view in, in Michigan. Uh, here's, here's a question that I love uh, to ask. The general reaction to the term, right? Fracking has become a term that's used. You hear it. 
Uh, it's, it's thrown out there. We don't know how much people, people know about it, but we could ask them what their general reaction is. If you hear the word fracking, is it positive or negative? Uh, and almost uh, basically identical numbers in Michigan and Pennsylvania with, with most uh, plurality, 45% uh, saying it's a negative term and uh, about 31%, a little bit, three in 10 saying it's, it's a positive term. I think that has a lot to do. Later on, I mean, it's a simple question, but a lot to do with the framing of the issue as we try to get specifics and details. Just from what point do we emerge? And, and, the, and the emerging of this issue, it's, the term itself has a negative connotation. As much as it has a negative connotation, the word, when you ask individuals, are there more benefits or problems from natural gas drilling in the state, when you ask them kind of that, that macro question on, the, on the, the benefits and problems, more Michiganders and more Pennsylvanians, almost identical or close, I should say, in terms of the, the percentages, say there are more benefits, that, that, that fracking uh, provides more benefits than problems for the state. And we'll see that in, in different levels. I won't get to all the details in this particular battery of surveys or, or questions, but that's something that, that emerges consistently in our, in our surveys in Pennsylvania. Um, then when you, when you go from the idea is it some more problems to your personal stance, do you strongly support uh, or somewhat support or strongly or somewhat oppose fracking in, in the most general, right now it's at the general concept, uh, you'll see this is where we, we start to see a little more divergence. And this might be part of the experience with, with fracking. Again, Pennsylvanians have, have been well engaged in the issue of fracking for a number of years. Michigan residents are just starting to experiencing it. And you could see a majority of Michiganders right now support the concept of fracking. Again, this is a broad concept with 54%. Uh, only 39% of Pennsylvanians share the same viewpoint. While you could see 49% uh, of Pennsylvanians at this point compared, compared to 35% of Michigan residents have opposition to the concept in its broadest sense, which again, I think is, is at one point where we just had vastly different experiences on the ground with this issue, and I think that might, might come across a little bit in the general opinions. Okay, for, from, from the general perspectives, let's, let's, no pun intended, drill down a little bit uh, on the risks and rewards of fracking. H how do we look at it uh, in terms of the public's perceptions of what are the biggest risks involved, and what are the biggest benefits that the public and the states themselves will gain from fracking in their, in their jurisdictions? So this, was, this is a question, I'm sorry it's a little bit of a busy table, but it's, it's probably the best way to look at it. We ask an open-ended question. What is the most important risk from fracking? So what is the most important? This is not prompted. This is individuals simply stating what they think is the most important risk. And you can see this is, again, I think a little bit from the experience on the ground and what the public thinks. Uh, water contamination in general was, other than don't know or not sure, the, 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 the single biggest uh, source or, or category for both Pennsylvanian and Michigan residents. Pennsylvanians, however, were almost twice as likely to say water contamination in general, and uh, you know, about the same in terms of groundwater. In Pennsylvania, and I think Eric can speak to this, the idea of groundwater contamination and the, the potential for groundwater contamination has been at the forefront of a lot of the controversy in the state. It's many news articles on it, lots of activism around that topic. It's fully engaged in the, in the public debate, I, probably less so uh, in, in Michigan at this point. And Pennsylvanians were more likely to identify that. Uh, you can see other categories that popped up in lesser degrees, health issues in, in general. Uh, the effect of pollution and, 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 and chemicals. Some of the things we talked about, earthquakes, uh, did, you know, popped up a little bit uh, on, the, on the chart. But you can see an array of, of issues. Michigan residents, I guess not surprisingly, were a little less like, or more likely to say they don't know or are not sure compared to Pennsylvanians uh, at this point, but not to a, uh, a large degree. So it, it, the public has, has differing views on what the risks are. Now, in terms of potential benefits of fracking, you know, what, what can uh, this do? This was, uh, unfortunately, I, I, there's a typo, it's, it was a closed-ended format. We gave these options uh, to the respondents, so we, we gave the options that you see on the screen um, and asked them what, what they think. And you could see some convergence, I guess, some pretty solid convergence be between Michigan residents and Pennsylvania residents, with the, the largest being uh, fracking provides and uh, a, or promotes energy independence 
by increasing the supply of fossil fuels extracted in the United States. About a quarter of Michigan and Pennsylvania respondents turned to that issue. Uh, closely followed by fracking provides an economic benefit by stimulating investment and creating jobs. These economic aspects of it are often heralded and trumpeted as, as the key to fracking as uh, an economic stimulus. And you can see those issues clearly uh, played a, a, a fairly big role. Um, this is just a follow-up, I, I guess, that ties nicely to the economic aspects of how the public is viewing this. We asked more directly, how important is natural gas to your state's economy right now? And you can see uh, that residents in Michigan and Pennsylvania uh, in, in, in very large numbers say it's either very or somewhat important that, that when you hear a address like Governor Snyder's or if you've been following Pennsylvania politics, our governor, Governor Republican Tom Corbett, has made this a centerpiece of his economic development strategies in the state uh, and transcending just natural gas and, and fracking, but also the processing and transportation and other aspects of it. So it is, is, is positioned as an economic driver, and the public generally believes that. All right, the last part uh, that I want to talk about from the survey, and again, I'm skimming over lots of details. There's tons more and, and levels of detail, and, and Christy and Erica will be playing with all those details, so much more to come on this. Uh, but what about regulation and taxation? These are, in terms of the policy debates, some of the most controversial uh, and, and bitter arguments that we have about fracking is how do we deal with, with this regulation? What level of government? Uh, um, Jacqueline talked a little bit about, about some of the legislation, legislation that's out there from states to say it has to be at the state level. Well, what's the public feel about that? Who, who should be regulating? Uh, will regulation deter economic development? The, 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 uh, when those two things come together, Right? If this is an economic stimulus, how do we, we find a way to have it both economically prosperous, uh, economically prosperous development at the same time protection of, of natural resources? Well, where does the, the public stand on extraction taxes? Should we tax this? At what level should we tax it? Um, and where should revenue from those taxes be used? Well, how, if we are going to tax it, where should it go? And, and those questions are, are on the mind. And so we asked individuals about this. First, the best level. Where should we regulate drilling? Where should we regulate? This has been a, an amazingly controversial aspect of the Pennsylvania story about who should be the one to say how drilling should take place, where could it take place? Uh, should it be at the federal, the state, or the local level? Well, well, in line with some of the legislation that Jacqueline pointed out, most individuals in both Pennsylvania and Michigan <coughs> Uh, feel it should be either at the state or local level. As you can see, the state uh, a little bit more likely in, in both conditions. Uh, Pennsylvanians were a little more likely to say local, not, not gigantic, and that's one of the big fault, fault lines, if you will, in Pennsylvania politics. Who should be doing this right now? So I think Pennsylvanians might be slightly more attuned to the, the role of the, uh, of the local governments. But clearly, it's not the, 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 the idea of the federal role in this remains quite limited. And if you look at federal activity on this matter. It is quite limited to date. It simply isn't, isn't, this, isn't there. So the public, uh, in, in some ways, is, is, is a, uh, enlightening on that, on that issue. So we asked a couple of questions, more specifically about the role that regulation might play in the economic development in the area. So we, uh, our statement was this. Tighter government regulations on the extraction of natural gas in Michigan or Pennsylvania, depending on the state, will lead drilling firms to leave the state, and so should be avoided. And as you can see, uh, both, a majority of both Michiganders and Pennsylvanians disagree with that statement. They don't buy the argument, if you will, that, that tighter regulations will lead to firms leaving the state, a, a non-significant portion of residents of both states do agree with the statement, but a majority don't. And in fact, in Pennsylvania, uh, about two out of three Pennsylvanians don't. And this is interesting because the governor, Governor Corbett in our case, made that very claim as his major reason uh, for behind Act 13, which is our, our legislation that Eric will talk about, that we couldn't uh, overregulate or we couldn't overtax because firms would leave the states. Pennsylvanians simply don't buy that. They don't buy the idea that that's, uh, that's the case. And to a large degree, Michigan residents don't buy it right now either, a little, bit, a little bit closer. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out as we go back into the field and measure Michigan public opinion on this down the road. Uh, 
sorry about the, my, my poor slide design. Uh, should the state adopt or retain a severance tax? Should, should they uh, actually keep their tax? In the case, as, as Jacqueline said and noted, Michigan does have an extraction tax, a severance tax. Pennsylvania does not. It is one of the few states that does not have a formal tax. It has an impact fee that I think Eric could talk about a, a little bit later, but does not have a severance tax. Uh, Michigan residents overwhelmingly, three out of four, say yes, we should uh, retain, in, our, in this case, their severance tax, that the idea of taxing this resource is, is very popular, 77 to 13 margin. In Pennsylvania, where the debate has been much more lively, much more engaged, much more developed over the last years, you still have about a two to one margin of Pennsylvanians saying this. And this, this continues to be, that's why you see legislation reemerging and bubbling up in, in Harrisburg to somehow do this. Uh, with the governor in place right now, it's very unlikely we're gonna probably see that in the next couple of terms. But public support uh, for a, a severance tax is there. Um, same thing, by the way, the, the argument about increasing taxes on natural gas will leave drillers to leave is a little bit more divided than the regulation d division that we saw in the earlier slide, but still one that, that you, can, you can see uh, a plurality of, of residents, in the case of Michigan, a, a majority feel that, that indeed taxes will not lead to individual, to, to drilling firms leaving the state. Um, this is, this is, again, sorry for the, the, the busy slide and a lot, a lot up there, trying to cram too much into a, a short time. Th these are preferences for use of revenue from a severance tax. A and ju to, to, to just throw it out there, how you use the taxes is really important for how you, uh, you sell the taxes to the public. And the idea of where would we use severance tax revenue? And as you can see here, reducing local property taxes is the single most common uh, answer for both the states. And that's, you know, if you follow Pennsylvania politics, and I imagine uh, for folks that follow Michigan politics, property tax is an ongoing concern and always something that people are trying to reform. And so in this case, tying those two together is, is an interesting uh, relationship in the public's mind. But other things like uh, supporting research on al alternative energy always polls uh, fairly well, along with reducing income taxes in general. So I, I could talk more about that later in the question and answer period. Here's my last slide, um, and, and I'll wrap up. Approval ratings. We, we've done this a lot in Pennsylvania for Governor Corbett over time, and he has polled fairly poorly. As you can see, mo the plurality of people don't know, right? We know about fracking, we know about the issue a little, we have feelings about it, but we don't know a lot about the details other than the principles we've talked about. Uh, Half of Michiganders have no idea about. Now, this is before his policy statement. This is before his statement, so it'll be interesting to go back uh, after. Uh, but Michigan residents are pretty divided right now on how he's handled it. Pennsylvanians, on the other hand, tend to, those that have an opinion, have a negative view of the governor's handling. And we have a lot more data on this over, over time if folks are interested. So I'll wrap up. Uh, citizens in Pennsylvania and Michigan maintain generally positive views about the, the contributions that fracking and natural gas development could mean, could mean for their states. They generally look at it in a positive way, but, but we've seen in the polling, we've seen in the surveys that, that we've done so far, that as much as they have a positive view about its potential, the handling, the implementation, the way that fracking is being done uh, through a government regulatory mechanism and taxation uh, scheme simply doesn't resonate in a positive way at this point. So as Michigan goes forward with this issue. It'll be really fun and interesting to track what goes on. But I'm out of time, and I'll wrap up there. Thank you very much. Good morning. Hi, everyone. And uh, thank you to, uh, to Barry and Paul and Bonnie and everyone here at Close Up for gathering this uh, this panel on a very important topic. Uh, Barry and Chris's, th their data has uh, been very helpful to journalists working in the field, but I have to say my favorite question is always the one, how much do you know about this issue or how closely are you following it, which means how closely are you reading the Post-Gazette? <laughs> and I'm heartened to see of an increase uh, year over year because it was only a couple years ago that we would get calls to the newsroom, people saying, who is the Marcellus Shale and why do you keep writing about him? <laughs> so. It's good that we're all sort of on the same page now that we know it's not a person that we're talking about all the time, 
on the uh, on the front page. I, I come to you from Pittsburgh, which, uh, according to some people, is the new energy capital of the world. Uh, to others, it's the greatest environmental catastrophe of our time. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit today about two uh, examples that we've seen in the tension between state and local re regulations in the wake of this Act 13 legislation that everyone's referring to. Act 13. Uh, refers to the bundle of legislation that was pulled together by a Republican governor um, earlier this year. It passed, and, and the biggest news that came out of it was the implementation of a per well impact fee, meaning that every driller paid a fee per well um, that they drilled in the state. Some call it a tax by any other name, um, but we're just now starting to see some of that revenue come in to the municipalities and the counties um, across the state. Um, for those of you who didn't, uh, brief yourselves on Pennsylvania geography this morning, you'll see that um, uh, Pittsburgh being here in the um, southwest pocket of the state is the biggest city uh, to be surrounded by natural gas drilling. Our, the city itself has passed what is a rather symbolic ban on fracking in city limits. No one thinks that it's gonna be you know, setting up a rig downtown, but they still passed a ban on it. Um, but in the counties surrounding Pittsburgh, especially down here, when you get into these border regions near Ohio and West Virginia, that is where some of the most concentrated drilling in the country is, uh, is taking place. Um, to give you an idea of what it's like on the ground to report this and to live in these communities uh, every day, I'll take you back uh, to last year when the Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu, put together a task force who were charged with writing guidelines for President Obama and the Energy Department on what to do about natural gas drilling. And they went to several communities with active development to hear public comment. And this was the meeting. Um, at one point, the, uh, the task force had to leave the auditorium um, because the crowd was getting so rowdy that they feared for their safety. Um, I should also say that um, many of the people in these photos do not live in the communities where the public hearing was held. Um, it's not uncommon for anti-drilling activists from more urban centers to bus supporters into meetings like this. Um, and also, the, the, the woman holding the sign in the, in the bottom photo, she actually lived in New York, and the industry paid for her and a group of sympathetic landowners to come to the meeting to tell the task force that they wanted drilling to occur in their state. So you can see um, the tensions between all levels of regulatory power from local to state and state to federal have been present for quite some time but really came to a head with the passage of, of Act 13. And uh, like I said, Act 13 has a lot of pieces of the legislation to it. What I'm going to talk a little bit about today is how it handled local ordinances. That is, local regulations um, that were drafted by different communities to handle gas drilling in their areas. And that means, uh, I'll just show you a little bit of a comparative look that we did on um, Pipeline, which is the website that I, that I edit. Um, this, this is a, an interactive look at some of the communities in Western Pennsylvania and how their regulations differ from one another. So you'll see, if you were to put up a well in South Fayette, you could not be located within 2,500 feet of a school or hospital, but if you went a couple yards away to Collier, you have to worry about being 300 feet from the Panhandle Trail, which is just a, a hiking trail. So you can obviously see that uh, this can be a major issue for gas drillers who like to plan drilling two years in advance. And if they have to grapple with specific, a specific set of rules and regulations for every tiny community in, in Pennsylvania, obviously it can impede uh, impede their development. And uh, it also becomes a pretty major issue when you realize that Pennsylvania has this many municipalities. Um, we really have a fetish for municipalities. I don't know what it is, but we really, um, we can't get enough of them. And so, you, and so you can see that the gas companies, what their, their analogy was, this is like uh, requiring a different driver's license in every state. Uh, it's just not feasible. And often, t um, back when the legislation was being drafted, what they advocated for as a compromise would be county-wide regulations, where the county would draft the, the ordinance. And they have similar operations in, uh, in Texas. Um, but the governor um, agreed with their more severe stance. And the Act 13 legislation stripped the, the local communities of that regulatory power and instituted a statewide uniform set of standards. Um, and immediately following the passage of the legislation, five municipalities in uh, southwestern Pennsylvania sued the state for that power back. And that's a, a little bit of the first case study that I want to talk about today. They said that um, 
By taking away local regulatory power, they had stripped local officials of protecting the health, safety, and welfare of their residents, obviously what they are charged to do when elected. Now, the case has woven its way through the courts, and the most recent decision that we have was from the Commonwealth Court, which sits right below the state Supreme Court. And the Commonwealth Court actually ruled in favor of the community, saying that um, the Commonwealth uh, plan should not be allowed because it does not protect the interests of neighboring property owners from harm, alters the character of neighborhoods, and makes irrational classifications. Now, um, what I should uh, highlight here is whenever we're talking about what these these regulations can limit. It's not just the skyscraper rigs that you associate with active gas drilling, but it's also compressor stations that don't need to be near active sites and impoundment pits that often carry nasty stuff like frack water and discharge. Um, so it's more than just the rigs that we're talking about. It's not just about making sure a rig isn't located near a hospital, but also how if a housing development doesn't want a compressor station on some of their common ground, that can certainly become a major issue very fast as well. The state, as you might expect, immediately um, appealed the Commonwealth Court decision, um, and it wove its way to the state Supreme Court, and um, that's where we remain. They, ha they held arguments for it uh, last month, and, and Chris keeps joking that the decision is going to come down while I'm here in Michigan, so if I'm seen fleeing the building, frantically calling people on my cell phone, it's because the decision has come down. They just posted on their website really conveniently for everyone and don't tell you if it's there or not. Um, but th it's been complicated by matters because one of the seven state Supreme Court justices is currently suspended pending a criminal trial. Um, so <laughs> we have uh, three Democrats and three Republicans hearing the case. Um, if they were to go on party lines, the Commonwealth decision would stand and the municipalities would regain their right to regulate on a township by township basis. Um, in the meantime, as Chris alluded to, the industry has implied that they would leave the state if they had to um, adhere to these onerous restrictions. Um, I think a very uh, common rebuttal to that is that the gas certainly isn't moving with them and that they would probably have to, have to adjust as well. Uh, just for comparison's sake, this, is, this, was, the, this was the scene at the uh, Supreme Court arguments because uh, they weren't allowed to take their signs inside and the judge's gavel really kept thing, th things to a, a dull roar during the, during the proceedings. Um, that's where we stand now. Like I said, we're anticipating a decision before the end of the year so you can, you can watch, for, watch for that. Uh, in the event that the municipalities regain their right, we're gonna have to really start looking at how they then draft their regulations because as you can imagine, um, the township solicitors are not very experienced with working with like a, a Chevron or an Exxon that's moving in with, with major development operations. Um, and the industry of, of course is always willing to, to help put their model regulations forward. Um, but what we're seeing really is a, a more a replicative uh, model where a lot of communities are using each other's to, to draft it and piece it together. Um, the other tension between uh, state and local interests I want to highlight uh, involves a large petrochemical facility that is slated to be built uh, outside of Pittsburgh. Has anyone here heard of the Shell Cracker Plant that's, that's been going? Okay, a couple smattering of, smattering of hands, that's good. So um, the petrochemical phase of gas development is often associated as the third chapter of industry development. You have the rigs that come in and extract the gas. Then you have the compressor stations and processing p pipelines that take the gas to market. And then finally you have the petrochemical facilities that do stuff with it. And Royal Dutch Shell, or as we know it, Shell announced that they were look interested in building a huge petrochemical facility, not unlike this one, uh, in West Virginia, Ohio, or Pennsylvania to take advantage of all of the gas being extracted from the Marcellus Shale. Um, obviously, it does not take long for uh, state officials to start salivating at such a prospect because of the jobs and the win that can come with it. So the three states jockeyed in trying to woo Shell to build in, in their state, and they did it with uh, tax incentives and major tax breaks, um, packaging um, different incentives together. Also, uh, every governor flew to Houston personally to try and lobby the company. Uh, Pennsylvania, quote unquote, won the uh, cracker plant, and it's going in a very small community uh, called Manaka, which is 
about 45 miles north of the city of Pittsburgh. Um, Manaka is the kind of place where if you ask a township supervisor how many people live there, they say 600 souls. They don't say 600 people. That's a direct quote. So um, you can see that um, something like this is a bit new for uh, a township like Manaka. Um, it's it's uh, also one of the first cracker plants that will be built in the United States. So it's also been heralded as a, as a geopolitical coup as we you know continue the the argument that domestic resources will help wean us from international supplies. Um, now. This is the uh, site where it's going. It's in, it's in the Potter Township. It's going atop a um, zinc smelting plant that is moving to North Carolina for a different tax break. Um, and uh, obviously, it's, it's going to cover hundreds of acres and take years to construct. And um, no job numbers, no hard job requirements were added to the incentive package. There was never a, you have to, uh, you know, create a thousand permanent jobs to get your get your tax breaks. Um, it has created an incredible uh, local hiccup for the local school district and the local township, because this zinc factory that you see here is the largest property taxpayer in the entire township. And by converting that land to tax exempt status, um, they sacrifice their largest property tax uh, payer. So Shell pays no property taxes for 22 years, saving more, an estimated $1 billion. The local school district loses um, the, zinc, the zinc plant right now pays $275,000 in property taxes to the local school district. The township loses $40,000 per year or 7% of its annual budget. That $40,000, uh, for comparison's sake, is about how much it costs to run their volunteer fire department for a year. Now, the state has said that the jobs and the economic growth and the spin-off companies that inevitably arise around petrochemical facilities will sort of counteract this or compensate for it. However, um, the, this loss in revenue is obviously coming at a time when it is needed the most because the school district is at capacity and will be expected to house any, uh, the children of any workers, or take it, not house, but you know, educate the children of any workers who move to the area. And the township has said that they, w they don't know how they're going to pay for water or sewer updates for the construction, let alone how they're going to pay for it without this additional $40,000 per year. So obviously, Shell sees the public relations disaster um, that is coming and um, agrees to pay a total of $7.6 million through a state program that allows it to pay 110% of what the zinc plant is currently paying in property taxes for 22 years. That amount remains static for the, in the entirety of the 22 years, does not adjust for inflation, um, and will add up to um, $300,000 per year uh, for 22 years for the local school district, and then obviously you can see, you can do the math, $44,000 per year for 22 years for the, the local township. And that's where we stand. Um, the, the township is so small that the uproar that you might expect over this kind of thing has uh, been relatively quiet, um, but it might uh, be increasing as construction begins because this is the third uh, piece of tax exempt property to go in the school district jurisdiction. The other two are a Walmart and Target, and obviously they're a little bit more excited about this one. Um, so uh, it's obviously, I think, one of the best examples we've had in our shale development of a decision that has major state and even global impl implications, uh, having incredibly unexpected and very local effects. Um, now, I just also wanted to, cl in closing here, uh, let you know how excited I am to see such a, a, a full house on a topic of fracking and let you know that you're very in right now being here. Um, I don't know if you heard, but last week, um, Jeopardy had a question in which the answer was, what is the Marcellus Shale? It was the uh, hardest question in the geology category. It was worth $2,000, and not a single person got it right. No one even guessed. Um, and so I just want, if you leave here with anything today, I want you to know that you are all smarter than at least three Jeopardy contestants <laughs> for knowing what the Marcellus Shale is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. Thank you, Jacqueline and Chris and Eric, for your presentations. We now move to the double bonus round of Jeopardy, <laughs> where we match our expert panel with an expert set of questioners and commentators, a mixture of faculty from this university and others, and our students. 
would like to begin noting that Ohio is the best way to get from Pennsylvania to Michigan back and forth. And Scott Miller has really been taking the lead at Ohio University and thinking through the Utica Shale and other aspects of, of that. Scott. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rabe, and I appreciate you allowing me the first question. I want to compliment you on bringing together this great panel. and What a great resource for the students and the, the community. Uh, my question revolves around um, you, you all did a fantastic job of laying out the fact that the primacy for the regulatory environment for the fracking industry lies at the state level, and much of that gets devolved down to the local level because the, the, the major impact of all of this comes at the local level, and Eric, you did a great job of, of laying out what the local communities are faced with. Uh, my question really revolves around, outside of what you were talking about, Eric, and, and, and the rest of the, the, the panel as well, and I'll, I'll also field this to, to Dr. Rabe as well, are there really good examples of local communities taking control of the, their local decision making and trying to push back what is, in, assess, in essence, um, a, a local communities with sometimes part-time employees pushing it back against major multinational organizations who have hundreds of years of experience in this, 100 years of experience in this. Is, are, there, are there good cases of folks pushing back? Yes, absolutely. And, and the best example that we've seen is in uh, a town called South Fayette, which is a bedroom community, a relatively wealthy community um, outside of Pittsburgh. And you can see the recipe when I describe it. So it is a lot of rural farmland outside of the city that has recently had a lot of housing developments put in. So you have a, a community made up of uh, you know, single family homes averaging around like $350,000 in value with farmers uh, next door. Um, so you have farmers who have signed leases with uh, families who have moved there obviously and not expected any kind of industrial development to, to crop up. Um, it came down to the uh, township supervisors who had to draft the, the ordinance allowing it. Um, whenever the community thought that the, the ordinance that they drafted was not restrictive enough, a majority of those supervisors were voted out of office um, and replaced mostly by first time office holders who had run exclusively on overturning their, their local regulations. So we, we have started to see uh, shale drilling become a wedge issue, not only in the governor's race, but also in school board races and uh, in township supervisors. Because one thing that shale drilling does is uh, sort of reverses the power structure in many respects and, and puts those offices, oftentimes part-time or volunteer, with the most power on deciding where rigs will go. And also, the, uh, the uh, city of Longmont in Colorado has passed a <coughs> fracking ban. Um, so I, I feel like we might start seeing more localities kind of take that approach until the state passes uh, stricter regulations. The only comment I would add is I think that we're beginning to see in a few jurisdictions, and it's interesting to think about this in Michigan, that are beginning to invoke the term best practices. What does that mean? <laughs> We've gone through a period for about 20 years where states and localities have taken expanded roles in all kinds of permitting issues that have some relationship to permitting. Many have thought about best practice issues, how do you integrate air and water, and I think a real challenge and opportunity for this area is sort of taking that body of experience and extending it into this area. It'll be really intriguing, as certainly as Jacqueline continues to do her work, to see if that trend begins to emerge at the state level, which for the most part probably, probably has not. Or comprehensive when you think of approach like that. That's right. Any comment from Ohio on that? I wish. Uh, okay. we're, we're, we're very early in the early stage. We talked about this last night. We're, we're approximately a year and a half into our fracking uh, boom right now. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, uh, about 475 permits. Um, that from last, uh, as of last year, we had a couple of dozen. So you can see the, the explosive growth, pardon the pun, in, in permitting. Um, and about 50 horizontal wells have been built just this year. So we're, we're early, much earlier than, than Pennsylvania and looking for those kinds of case studies, best practices, uh, because uh, local, local municipalities are just really uh, outmatched here. Delighted to call on a current resident of the state of Michigan, but if memory serves, a former resident of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I have to say, as a former resident of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, 
Um, the, the how many thousands of, of townships? Uh, 2,500. 2, I was once, uh, I once had an issue with law enforcement um, as a customer um, in uh, the township of Nether Providence. And I always kind of loved it as I was being hauled away from whatever I was doing. Nether Providence, is that cool or what? Anyhow, um, um, I, I got out, it was okay in the end. Um, the, um, uh, the question I want to ask is about, about disclosure, I, I, um, and there have been legislation kind of on both sides of it. Um, uh, and I know that, that many in the industry have basically argued that disclosing the details of the chemicals that they're, that they're pumping into the ground to do horizontal fracturing, um, uh, hydraulic fracturing, um, is, a, is a trade secret of sorts. So they don't want to do it because other firms uh, might get the news on exactly how much of what um, uh, is in the, in the formula. Um, I guess my sense is that that's um, uh, an unpersuasive story uh, against a public interest um, uh, where you'd, you'd really like to know. So, so should, why would we not want to have a regulatory structure in which uh, entities that are engaging in this kind of work that is affecting groundwater provide quite a detailed story about exactly what they're doing and exactly what they're pumping in, how they're dealing with it, and, and why it's okay? I, that, Paul, that's a great, great point, and you're absolutely right. It's one of the few areas, I didn't show the slides today, and we've asked this in Pennsylvania and in the Michigan context right now, and it's one of the places where there's just overwhelming agreement. It's 80% plus when we ask, is this in the public interest or is it, should it be protected as a trade secret? Um, and there's no debate among the public on that compared to a lot of debate and, and middle ground in the others, and it's simply, it, it, in Pennsylvania, and Eric could probably speak more to this, or, 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 or Jacqueline, Pennsylvania's law, Act 13, was, was fairly weird in, well, in many ways, but it was really weird on this provision because uh, it, 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 it created a dichotomy of where you had to give full disclosure based on the depth of the wells, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, if, if it's at a certain depth or below, you didn't have to disclose the chemicals, and if, if it was at a, a higher level, you would have to the, the chemicals, so it's, um, it, it, oh, I'm sorry, is there, is there, oh, they're not working, oh, that's right. So, so, so the, and the long and short of it is the public is, as you said, completely in agreement that, that this should be full disclosure. Um, the state, on the other hand, created uh, legislation that hasn't done that, and the, the whole process of disclosure remains pretty clouded, even though frack focus and, and others, but. You could probably. Well, yeah, the, the industry response has always been that they do disclose. They put the, all of the chemicals up on a website called Frack Focus, although Bloomberg has done some amazing reporting this, this year on just how many holes remain even in those Frack Focus reports. However, I would just caution that um, while disclosure of the fracking chemicals does see unanimous support um, and is an important element, it can oftentimes overwhelm some of the other concerns that people have with the drilling process, and Jacqueline alluded to this, where sometimes the, uh, the impoundment pits and the drill cuttings can be just as nasty as the chemicals that are thousands of feet underground. And on a local level, I think um, things like truck traffic can be um, all, the, all the more severe and all the more everyday to, to residents than, than disclosure of the fracking chemicals. And I would just add, well, first off, I'm also from Nether Providence, Pennsylvania. Um, <laughs> so I know exactly where you're coming from. But um, we're also starting to see some states uh, introduce legislation that would require disclosure just in certain circumstances or to certain people, for instance, doctors, or if, if there's a health um, issue, uh, just uh, different, different circumstances. Um, so I, I would kind of expect that to be more commonly enacted at first um, before the full disclosure, uh, just because the industry is pushing back on the trade sec secret issue so strongly. Erica Brown. Okay. Um, thanks again for taking the time to speak to our class um, and all our visitors. We've talked a lot in our class about the role of uh, public opinion and public policy, uh, particularly when you have an issue like this that's very complex um, and requires a certain amount of scientific knowledge um, and technical knowledge. 
So the question that Christy and I had for uh, you guys is, Eric, in your experience um, reporting on the issue in Pennsylvania, how have you seen the role of public opinion and the public's role in shaping policy? And then Jacqueline, in your experience researching legislation um, and working with state legislators, how have you seen uh, the role of public, pol public opinion um, in shaping their concerns? Um, and then we also have a follow-up for Chris sure. afterwards. <laughs> Take it away. Um, I think at, at kind of the more 50 state uh, perspective, it's we've seen a little bit less of that coming into play than maybe just directly in Pennsylvania. And it tends to be, um, you feel it a lot stronger in the states that are really starting to see this influx of drilling. Um, so I, I think the public opinion's possibly coming into play a lot more in states like Pennsylvania than um, states like maybe Texas where they've been drilling for a long time and it's not necessarily a new activity. Um, I think Eric might have more to say on that though. <laughs> you know, one of the one of the cruel alchemies that have, has emerged in Pennsylvania is that the um, more drilling there is in a community, there tends to be the less advocacy or activism in that community. Um, the, the activism against drilling or in, in favor of more stringent regulations is very concentrated in the urban areas like Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, where there is no there are no rigs, but if you go to Greene County, which is in the, in the southwest uh, corner of Pennsylvania, has the second highest concentration of wells in that region and almost no activist presence or advocacy presence. So that's the dynamic that we're seeing. And so a lot of more, a lot more complicated political factors come in very quickly where uh, you'll go to these meetings and like the photos I showed, it quickly becomes an argument about, oh, don't be thrusting your city values on our country living and no one understands the other. And those, and then it becomes quickly becomes a, a much more divisive and bigger bigger divide. Um, I think though at this point we've gotten to a point where at least from the press perspective it often feels like no matter what we write the article becomes a litmus test for what that person already believed. Um, the lines are pretty clearly drawn at this point um, among you know engaged citizens I think. Um, now that being said you know um, we did have a candidate for governor announce his candidacy this week and uh, he did he's a former Department of Environmental Protection Secretary and he's emerged since his his tenure there as a bit of a shale superstar. He keeps a blog about it and everything, but he doesn't seem to be running a race that is only a referendum on shale drilling so far. It seems more, as I read it, it seems to um, put education and education funding as a higher priority, and I think that's probably because he probably couldn't run a state for statewide office on shale drilling alone. It's just not um, permeating a a, a huge part of the a huge part of the state, just by nature of where the drilling actually is. Um, so, sorry, we couldn't do only one question. Yes. Our follow-up to Chris um, was: since you've spent a lot of time with the public opinion data, we were wondering if you could design a policy for Pennsylvania that really reflects public opinion. What would that be, and specifically, how would that differ from what's actually been enacted? Uh, that's a great, great question, and I, I think you know we we polled this now for a number of uh, of years, and I think the two biggest differences probably are two things we've just talked about already. The transparency rules, I think, if you look at public attitudes on this, are overwhelming. And I don't think Act 13 jived very well with public perception on that. And I think if, if we, if we, haven't, we haven't asked as a battery really to dig down on that, but I, there's just very little buy-in to the idea that, that the, public, the public safety should be put in jeopardy for a trade secret. It just doesn't, it doesn't hold water. Um, the other is simply on the tax issue. Pennsylvanians, and this is, I think Eric had a really good point uh, about John Hanger, who is the, the former uh, DEP director who's running for, for governor. He is, he's in shale, he is a, you know, a superstar, he's on the forefront of the, those issues. But he's, he's touching in when he pushes education policy and education funding. Over the last few years, Pennsylvania, like a lot of states, has cut back on funding to higher education and secondary education in the state. When you juxtapose that against the, the potential revenue that could be coming 
from Marcellus shale extraction in the state, it's not good in the optics. It doesn't look good for, for Governor Corbett, and that's why you see his numbers are low. His, his numbers are low on a lot of things right now, and that's why you're getting candidates coming forth to, to rush in him. So I, so I think Eric's absolutely right. Even though it's been a, a very big issue in the state, it's, it's, it's not an issue that could probably win or lose you an election, but when you match it, when you say, look, you're leaving money on the table while you're cutting schools. You're leaving money on the, on the, on the table while you're cutting state park budgets. Um, and I think, I think that's a good narrative to weave together. So if you're looking at public opinion in the state, I think in the next race, the idea that are we benefiting as much? Pennsylvanians think it's good for the state. I think they don't think it's been handled in a way that provides the maximum amount of benefit for the Commonwealth as a whole. I didn't show the slides that Barry and I have, have done in some other surveys to ask, is this a private resource or a public resource? And overwhelmingly, Pennsylvania thinks it's a public, re public resource. So I think the public benefits have to be bigger. That's a really, really good question. We could obviously extend this conversation for some time, but we do need to close. I just want to make a couple of observations. Uh, one is that all of these presentations will be posted on the close-up website shortly. And we will be releasing a report in about one month's time, a close-up Muhlenberg report, uh, that will go into these survey findings in much more detail and also include a good deal of background on the emerging fracking issues in both Pennsylvania and Michigan. So, so be mindful of that. I also can't help but note, especially given this last point in exchange on taxation, as Chris noted, uh, we are now rolling out an umbrella of surveys under the label of the National Surveys of Energy and Environment, again, a partnership between the Ford School and, and, and the Muhlenberg Institute. Uh, the first of the, the survey reports coming out on this are focusing on the issue of public opinion on climate change, especially policy options as relate to climate change. That will be released on Wednesday. And would only there note that a substantial focus there relates to the issue of taxation and energy taxation, gasoline taxes, carbon taxation, both public support and approval, but also the issue of revenue use and whether or not revenue use has any impact on how the public feels about those kinds of issues. So do indeed stay tuned for that. Final points, uh, one is uh, just really want to thank uh, all members of the panel for coming and convening and being part of this. You know, this is an issue that's been emerging for a number of years, and it's one where the social and policy sciences have been relatively slow to come to the table and engage. The natural and physical sciences, the engineering sciences have been much more actively involved for a longer period of time. And so one of the things that we're very eager to do through the center is to begin to close that gap and really draw on the remarkable resources that we have at this university and our other partners and begin to think about issues of constructive engagement on this issue. This issue. And with that, if you wouldn't mind joining me in closing by thanking our panelists and questioners for their <laughs>